Originally, I was going to showcase the new retro room I put together over the last few months, but then eBay showed me a listing of every player's choice GameCube game, and naturally... Oh yeah. So, player's choice. What does that even mean? Player's choice was a way to show customers that a lot of people were buying a specific game and that it also sold well. For games like Melee, Mario Sunshine, The Wind Waker, that makes perfect sense. But interestingly, a lot of movie license games also have this label like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, and Attack in the Power of Juju. Ah yes, a certified hood classic. Retro collectors tend to avoid games with these labels because they aren't initial release copies. And it also looks very off with the box art's general darker colors but having them all bundled together is kind of cool, at least to me. The set that I found even comes with every rare multi-pack besides one. The first multi-pack pits Monkey Ball 1 and 2 together. Normally, Monkey Ball 1 complete in box runs for around 27 bucks, and Monkey Ball 2, 25 bucks. But this multi-pack is extremely rare, and ranges from 600 to 1500 dollars. That's right, this piece of cardboard, holding the same two games you can get for around 60 bucks each, cost hundreds more. The back box art is pretty funny to me. Go bananas with 90 plus stages, multiplayer madness, and seven cool ways of playing. <laughs> I don't know, just something about seven cool ways of playing is just worded so goofily. And also, it's promoting monkey golf and dog fighting, but not Target, which is definitely the fan favorite minigame. My copy of this multi-pack is still sealed, and honestly, I'm keeping it that way because I have the games from the initial release and player's choice already. Thankfully, the Resident Evil 10th Anniversary Club collection isn't nearly as ludicrous. For Resident Evil 0, 1, and 4, you can grab this collection for around $225 to $500. That is, assuming you don't know Steam or Hundle Bundle exists, don't, don't tell anyone you can get those games for dirt cheap. But alas, the cardboard surrounding the games is once again worth hundreds of dollars. To be fair, the box art is really cool looking. We got a badass picture of Mendez on the front and El Gigante on the back. I really like the red, orange, and black color scheme. It oozes creepiness and makes the characters stand out more. Interestingly, every Resident Evil game uses two discs to play. Resident Evil 1 and 0 both have this icon on the front that says two disc product, but Resident Evil 4 doesn't for some reason. I'm not sure why this label is on these two games specifically, but not the other one. The regular box for RE4 doesn't have that label. Hell, even the other games with two discs don't have it either. So I'm really curious what went about in the marketing department back in the day. Finally, there's the Sonic Adventure 2 pack, which includes Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. This bundle ranges from $700 to $1,000, and that's if you're lucky since people try to sell this pack for even more. This one has my favorite box art as it takes the art style from Sonic Adventure 2 and incorporates it into some of the Sonic Adventure 1 characters. They didn't have to put in that much effort, but I highly appreciate that it did and it looks awesome. The back box art is a bit questionable. The top portion promotes the second game, while the bottom the first game game. Why is this out of order? Also, the yellow and black font look kind of awkward. Like, I get they're showcasing each game's purpose, but it looks a little off to me. And I don't even have the Sonic Hero slash Super Monkey Ball Duo pack. I have the games themselves, so it's still a full collection technically, but it's by far the rarest multi-pack out there. According to Price Charting's website, less than 10 have been sold online, and that's just an estimate. Nobody knows how many Duo packs were actually made, but it couldn't have been very many if they're this hard to find online. There's virtually no information about this pack's existence, outside of some forums talking about how people have spent years looking on eBay before even one shows up. But back to the video games. I think at this point, we're all aware of what Animal Crossing is. It started on the GameCube, even though it was planned for the N64 disk drive initially. This collection also came with a special edition memory card. I have the version with a picture of Rover, but there's also a KK Slider variant. On top of that, Nintendo Power number 165 came with a sticker with a villager, but you had to add this to a normal memory card. The Animal Crossing memory card would give you a couple of gifts, the KK Love Song and two NES games. I'll just be honest. 
honest, I know virtually nothing about Animal Crossing, but I tried to see if I could find the NES games with a memory card I have. While it did have Animal Crossing data on it, I couldn't find the GIFs. So the card itself may have been wiped at one point, the data was reset or used for other purposes, I have no idea. The promo paper is really charming. It's got a picture of the post office from the game telling you to subscribe to Nintendo Power, and it's just adorable. Oh, also, I've got two copies of The Wind Waker now. The more interesting being the Not For Resale variant, which is ironic considering it has the Player's Choice label on it. But it kind of makes sense because this version was included with a special GameCube bundle. There's nothing different about each respected game as they're identical besides the box art. I do want to point out how gorgeous the instruction manual art is. It's just bursting with color and features most of the game's core characters. And check out this sweet picture of Link swinging a sword. See, this is the kind of stuff I miss in physical games. Speaking of Zelda, we've got Four Swords Adventures, which is a game I've always been intrigued to try out. A four-player Zelda game sounds like a pretty fun time. It was one of the few games to work with the Game Boy Advance to GameCube Link cable. And again, this instruction manual art is striking and beautiful. I mean, just look at this front cover. You really grow to appreciate manuals like this one when most of the games I checked were boring, black and white, and very lazily put together. Interestingly, Mario Golf got the player's choice box, but Mario Power Tennis didn't. It has a bestseller variant, but not player's choice. I guess people just hated tennis in the early 2000s. Freaking idiots bouncing a ball back and forth with a stick. Ugh, so stupid. I adore the disc of Mario Golf, as half of it is a golf ball texture. And Waluigi's description and the instructions are great. You might be getting better, but nobody cheats better than me. You got that? Ah, never change, Waluigi. Never change. And can we just talk about these ridiculous renders of Mario? The perspective is so weird. They made Mario's feet and legs so big, almost as if we're supposed to look at him like a golf ball. One of the more spendy games in this collection is Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. That's to be expected as it's one of Nintendo's best RPGs. Mario Sunshine got the player's choice treatment too, although that's not a surprise since it was the only 3D Mario on the platform. Then you've got all the Sonic games. This is how I was properly introduced to Sonic as a kid. I did have the Sonic Advance games and technically beat Sonic 3 and Knuckles when I was like 4 years old, but man, Sonic Mega Collection, Adventure 2 Battle, Heroes, these are some of my most cherished memories from the GameCube and franchise. I'm kind of surprised Sonic Riders has player's choice considering a lot of people didn't like it for its extremely sharp learning curve and difficulty. Shadow the Hedgehog is not that surprising because he was and still is the cool Sonic bad boy. I've never owned the manual for Sonic Mega Collection until now, and was disappointed to see all the pages were in black and white. In fact, all the Sonic games were like this. Now, I'm sure it was to reduce cost, but the front and back are in full color, so why not the rest of it? This is Sonic we're talking about. Put in the extra effort, Sega. But what are the spendiest games in the collection besides the multi-packs? We've already talked about a couple, but there's also Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes, Pokemon Coliseum, Wario World, F-Zero GX, Kirby Air Ride, and Pikmin 2. Wario World is a game I always wanted to try out, and what I played was a surprisingly enjoyable 3D platformer. The game is sitting at around $86. My question though is why does it look like Wario has no pupil here? Kinda creepy, dude. I also love this random diagram of Wario that shows off Wario's futures. He apparently has 2070 vision, can hold 22 gallons in his stomach, and can hold 1.1 gallons of urine in his bladder. Then there's F-Zero GX, by far one of Nintendo's most underappreciated IPs out there. We'll likely never get a new F-Zero again, which explains why this one is worth about $83. The table of contents piqued my interest when I saw Logitech Reserved Speed Force Controls, so I flipped to it, and it's a third-party steering wheel controller that Nintendo actually put in their manual. So of course, I had to buy one to see what the fuss was all about. This wheel's actually kind of cool, but also has some bizarre design choices. To use it, you need some sort of table in front of you, and you twist these knobs and basically wrench it down so it won't move. That's pretty smart design, actually, and I like how these little lever things on the back feel. But what isn't smart is moving the B button to this awkward spot on the bottom. Maybe in playtesting, they thought the layout would work better, but when I played, I kept pushing down where the B button usually is and nothing happened. I'm not gonna lie, I sucked ass when I did a test race, but there was actual force feedback as it claims, and it made the game a bit more immersive. 
Kirby Air Ride is another great racing game, most notable for its addictive city trial mode. It sits at $81. The instruction manual is beautiful from start to finish. Every page is so well presented and is just fun to look at. I also love how we're explicitly told to annoy your rival. I've played a little bit of Pikmin 2 in the past, and I'm not sure why this one costs more than the first game. It sold only slightly worse than Pikmin 1, so it's kind of weird if you ask me, considering it's sitting at $104. Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes is worth $111, and for good reason. They're pretty solid remakes of Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. This also happens to come on two discs. Konami knew this game was worth putting on the GameCube, and was willing to make the sacrifice and print two discs to fit everything. Finally, there's Pokemon Coliseum, which is sold complete for around $121. It's basically a 3D Pokemon game, but has a lot of strange changes like starting with Espeon and Umbreon, as well as catching Shadow Pokemon from trainers. Now look, I'm not going to be able to talk about every game in this collection, there's way too many of them to cover, so I'll just pick the ones that seem the most interesting, including Crash Bandicoot Wrath of Cortex. A few years ago, I played Crash 1 on PC, and uh, I kind I kind of enjoyed it. I mean, parts of that game were just infuriatingly hard. Wrath of Cortex is more of the same thing. In fact, it was critiqued for playing it too safe. I still had some fun with this one and would like to finish it one day, although apparently the vehicle segments and some level design aren't too enjoyable. Speaking of Microsoft properties, there's two Spyro games that got the player's choice treatment. I recently played the Reignited Trilogy on PC and had an absolute blast with them, especially with the first game. It was so much fun plowing through levels and collecting all the gems and that's not to downplay Spyro 2 and 3 because those were also really good, but the unnecessary backtracking kind of ruined the pacing for me at times and made it a little less fun. So with all that said, I was curious to play some other Spyro titles, and I started with The Hero's Tale. It's very much like the originals. It doesn't seem to change much from what I played, and I honestly really like that. The main difference is that instead of levels, it's much more open world. Spyro Enter the Dragonfly is similar to the originals too, but suffers from frame rate issues, glitches, and is also a much smaller game than its predecessors. This is another franchise that I'd love to be more in depth with in the future, but for now we must move on. And move on we must to the SpongeBob titles. I think we're all pretty aware of Battle for Bikini Bottom at this point. The game got a remake a couple years ago and is still a really fun platformer. The other SpongeBob games, on the other hand, are a different story. SpongeBob SquarePants Light Camera Pants is essentially a minigame compilation. The minigames aren't that bad. Actually, some of them are pretty fun, but they can go on for way too long. They try to make things more interesting by speeding them up over time, but the issue is that they could be 45 seconds long instead of 3 to 5 minutes. Then you've got the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, which is a lot more like Battle for Bikini Bottom. You run around levels collecting stuff, but now you can upgrade your moves and health, which is really neat. It's another SpongeBob game that's surprisingly enjoyable, although being forced to replay levels to get tokens is a bit pointless. But what about the Star Fox games? I've honestly never finished one before. Like, I've dabbled with the N64 one, but that's about it. So I started with trying Star Fox Adventures, and I left feeling very confused. I played as Crystal for the first 25 minutes in this dungeon that reminded me of a silver level from Sonic 06, then I was flying for like two seconds and eventually found Crystal's staff. It's a Zelda clone that is strangely fun in some aspects, but it's not really a Star Fox game. Star Fox Assault, on the other hand, is a lot more traditional, and frankly, way more fun than Adventures. Even the on-foot sections are pretty good. It's a short game, but a really good one at that. But yeah, those were some of the games that I really wanted to try over the years. Everything else here, I'm just interested in their boxes, like the Mega Man Anniversary Collection. It's got Mega Man 1 through 8, and this really pretty art of Mega Man on the front cover. I also love this random kid wearing the Mega Man X suit in this promo material. I wish I was as cool as him. Chicken Little has the weirdest thing I've ever seen in an instruction manual. There's a literal coupon for Jolly Time Blasto Butter. Now, it might have expired in 2006, but I'm gonna try it anyway. Sad. The crazy taxi box just looks tacky to me. The entire front is yellow, then you've got the player's choice up top, and the side panel is entirely yellow. It's hilariously awful, and I kind of love it for that. Upon checking out Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, I noticed how bad the disc can look sometimes. The trademark text is on it with like a four-point font. Why did they even bother? It's impossible to read, and it's not even the only disc to do this. MVP Baseball 2005. 
2005 for the 2005 season, just so you're sure it's from the year 2005. Now here is Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2. This was one of those random games I owned as a kid and never played it because I was dumb and couldn't get very far, but I do remember this box art very well. The bright flashing police lights are ingrained in my memory for eternity. Pac-Man vs. Pac-Man World 2 is another game I own, and I love this one to death. This is by far one of my favorite underrated platformers. Even nowadays, it's one I can recommend to anyone. However, I never had a chance to play the Pac-Man vs. game because I never had the Game Boy Advance cable. Next, we've got Over the Hedge, and it uses 35 blocks of storage. My question is, why? Like, what on earth is the reason for a game like this using that much storage? And that's not even that bad compared to The Sims busting out with a whopping 165 blocks like holy f now this is the sims so yeah it kind of makes sense but a lot of memory cards only had like 59 blocks they should have found some sort of workaround my rampage total destruction disc looks really odd because the details on the logo are completely missing it almost looks like a thick red line with white outer glow and i'm not sure if that's something that's faded over time or what's going on here in contrast the manual for the simpsons hit and run is breathtakingly beautiful there's an almost comic strip feel to it and it has a very minimalist style i actually enjoyed reading this manual because everything is properly condensed. And Pikmin is pretty similar. It's got really pretty cell shaded art, and there's even this size comparison page that shows you how big Pikmin are compared to real life objects like a GameCube disc. Shrek 2's manual has this really weird thing with the page numbers. There's a silhouette of Shrek's head, Shrek, and Donkey that swap out every three pages or so. I'm not sure what the reasoning is for this. It doesn't seem to have any pattern from what I can tell. Oh, and also, the game itself is pretty solid. It's a four-player co-op beat-em-up ordeal, and I'd actually recommend trying this one out. Pac-Man Fever, on the other hand, isn't up to par, but it does have a bunch of wild characters. You've got Hayahachi and Tiger from Tekken, Astroth from Soul Calibur, and I quote, that hot driver Raikou from Ridge Racer 4. Well done, Namco, using sex appeal to sell a Pac-Man game. That's not weird at all. That's my video about Player's Choice GameCube games. Did you like it? Great. If not, I'm sorry.